Good morning. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here at RARAF for integrating microfluidics with microbeams. And this is a collaboration between us and uh, uh, mechanical engineering at Columbia University. Um, why do we want to do microbeams? Well, you already know that. You've heard a lot over the last two days about why microbeams are important. But why microfluidics? Well, microfluidics is the science of manipulating small amounts of liquid in channels of tens to hundreds of microns width. It provides high throughput automation of single cell analysis. So you can analyze a lot of single cells in parallel or sequentially. And our aim is to make a sort of generic, reconfigurable manipulation platform for handling cells floating in suspension, uh, where the main thing is to handle a lot of individual cells, where each cell is uh, irradiated individually and then analyzed individually. Again, we want to perform the irradiation, sorting, dispensing, and analysis in microfluidics systems. And this is sort of a step forward from the amoeba system that Alan was talking about, which aims at doing a lot of this stuff on a more macroscopic scale. I'll be talking about three uh, irradiation platforms that we're developing. The flow and shoot system, the optoelectronic tweezers, and the worm clamp. And then touch a little bit about the analysis devices that we're looking at for uh, analyzing the cells after irradiation. The FAST, it's a flow and shoot micro, uh, technology. It's microfluidics for the microbeam. Uh, currently, as you've seen in the demos yesterday, we irradiate cells attached to microbeam dishes. And we can either move the dish to where the beam is, or we can move the beam to where the cells are uh, on the dish using a point and shoot system. And what we're proposing here is a sort of radical paradigm change where we're not using fixed cells any or attached cells anymore, but we're flowing them through a channel and then targeting them using the point and shoot system as they flow by. After they're irradiated, they can then be dispensed into some sort of analysis system, which we are looking to our users to provide. It would be a different system for every endpoint that our users are interested in. Uh, this is mounted on the permanent magnet microbeam, which features a five micron diameter beam with uh, about 5 MeV of either alpha particles or protons at uh, rates of a few thousands per second, uh, at least with the protons. And what we're essentially doing is bonding a microfluidic chip to the exit window of the microbeam. Uh, first of all, how do we do the targeting? The nice thing about microfluidics is you can set up your channel so that cells flow laminarly. So basically, they're flowing in straight lines, so you can grab multiple images and predict where the cell is going to be at any given time, and then irradiate it. In order to implement this, we have acquired a fast camera. This is a scientific CMOS technology that only reached the market about a year ago, to combining high sensitivity with fast imaging speeds. And what the manufacturer quotes is 100 frames per second, for five and a half megapixels. And of course, we're stepping down the resolution by doing a binning and areas of interest. And we want to be able to increase the uh, frame capture speed, maybe up to 1,000 frames per second, in order to increase our throughput. Uh, in order to track the cells, we grab images sequentially. We locate the cells in the image in real time and then predict the position using this formula, which is nothing more than the old position plus the velocity times whatever time interval we're looking at. And while this looks simple, there's quite a lot of bookkeeping that needs to be done to make sure that you're always tracking the same cell between the different images, even if it, uh, for some reason, isn't imaged in one of the frames. You sometimes get blank frames out of the camera, uh, you want to make sure that you're not irradiating the same cell more than once. 
So what we have here is a picture of a fluorescent bead taken at time zero. The next picture taken 30 milliseconds later. The bead has moved 75 microns. And another 30 milliseconds later, we've, uh, the cross represents the actual position of the bead. The circle represents uh, the predicted position. Uh, and then this just gets better and better as you're uh, acquiring more images. And what we've seen uh, with this system is when we are taking uh, beads flowing at that rate, at 30 frames per second imaging, we can guarantee that about two-thirds of the beads are targeted within a 5 micron uh, precision. Uh, and the error is almost entirely in the direction of flow. So we can fix this by taking more pictures and or flowing the cells or the beads uh, slower. What about cells? We have here a movie that I took last week of uh, human endothelial cells which have been trypsinized so they don't stick to the walls of the channel. And these cells actually express a uh, green fluorescent protein so they weren't stained. Uh, they were just imaged and uh, targeted using our system. Okay, now that we know where the cells are, we need to shoot them. So we have a point-and-shoot system, which uh, Gerhard talked about um, on the first day. This is a magnetic system with coils that can deflect the beam in both directions very rapidly. This means that you can go to a different position every millisecond or so. And they're mounted below the upper triplet on the Microbeam 3 end station. And if you look down on the accelerator exit window, which is sort of this circle, this is a view through the microscope, what we're seeing here is the spot size as a function of the deflection of the point and shoot. So at the center here, we have maybe a six micron spot size. But if you position your channel sort of like this, you can pretty much guarantee that wherever you're deflecting the beam, your spot size is not degraded. And this is really important because you want to be hitting the cells. This is the microfluidic chip uh, that we're using. It has a channel going across, coming down. The microbeam exit window would serve as the bottom surface of this channel. And you have here a bigger channel where we apply a weak vacuum to bond this uh, chip to the exit window. Uh, this way we're guaranteeing that the cells are very close to the exit window and there's no scattering or no significant scattering which will degrade uh, our targeting accuracy. And we're about ready to start cell irradiations uh, sometime this spring. Uh, the second system, the optoelectronic tweezers, is an optical system for manipulating cells. It's in collaboration with uh, Professor Ming Wu in Berkeley who devised uh, this system. And this is somewhat different from the optical tweezers you might be familiar with. Uh, regular optical tweezers use a laser to create very strong uh, optoelectric fields to trap the cells. Here we're not using a laser and we're using rather weak fields. So we feel that we're perturbing the cells a lot less. The way the device is made is you have two electrodes. A, a conductive glass electrode, it needs to be transparent so that you can image the cells through it. And a photoconductor, uh, typically we use amorphous silicon, a very thin layer so that we can get beam through it. Uh, if you project a light pattern on the photoconductor, only the illuminated regions become conducting. So if you were to apply an AC field, then only in this region the AC field can penetrate into the medium and cells or beads or whatever you have in there actually get repelled from these electric fields and so uh, they would avoid the illuminated regions. And you can make very complex uh, patterns and trap cells, uh, say in a circle like that, move it around to wherever you want or constrain it to not be in a uh, any specific area and what you can very easily do is set up a complex pattern that will hold specific cells at uh, specific distances from each other uh, for the irradiation or for any length of time post-irradiation. 
So we've received some of these chips from Berkeley and have started making them ourselves at the Columbia Clean Room. Uh, and we've done some tests on Microbeam 2. Uh, this is, for example, one of the chips we had with a Kapton spacer between these two glass slides. And we were able to flow beads into it and out. Uh, this was mounted at <coughs> the Microbeam 2 end station and we used the multi-photon light path to either introduce light from the multi-photon laser which can be scanned in a pattern on the OET or using a projector very similar to the one uh, we have here to show this presentation. This is the first test that we did probably a couple of years ago now we use the laser from the multi-photon system to just draw this uh, almost B, V pattern with a little opening here. And then uh, the blue spots are fluorescent beads, 10 micron beads, in the liquid. And we use the stage to just move them across the pattern. And now we'll see if the movie works. And it does. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> you can see that the beads avoid the illuminated region. See if I can run it again. And you can easily imagine having a microbeam here and shooting these cells as they flow through one by one. Since then, we've uh, developed, we now have a projector uh, integrated into the system. And what you can see here is a group of beads. When you turn on the light in the field, they all go into the dark region in the middle, and you can move them around. We do have one bead here that is stuck to the glass, but most of them do move around. So the next step that we're working on now is to get this working with cells. And there is some uh, complications in this because you need to have very good control of the conductivity of the liquid that the cells are in. It needs to be rather low, and so you need to use special kinds of uh, cell culture medium to get this working. Now those two systems are designed for handling single cells. What about animals? Uh, we've heard uh, about worms today from uh, Brian slash Antonella. And we're actually trying to use microfluidics to control these worms and immobilize them for the irradiations. Because what we've seen is if you put worms in a microbeam dish, they tend to run all over the place. They're very mobile. And the experiments that Brian showed were done by anesthetizing the worms using azide, I believe. Uh, and we think that that may introduce a perturbation to the biological endpoints we're interested in. So we would prefer to have a non-chemical immobilization of the worms. So in order to do that, uh, um, the Whitesides group at Harvard have developed these worm clamps, which are tapered microfluidics channels, which the worm can swim into, but then when he reaches this region, he gets stuck. And if you apply a very small pressure differential between the two, the inlet and the outlet, it cannot swim back, and it will stay wherever you want it to stay and you can easily target it whatever, wherever you want for the radiation. These clamps were actually divide, uh, developed for doing uh, imaging of worms. A uh, high resolution, you don't want the worm to be moving. Um, and I showed yesterday at the tour uh, one of these clamps that uh, were made for us that have a very thin bottom so that we can actually get a microbeam in through uh, to the channels and irradiate the worms. Uh, here we have a picture of one of the worms in a clamp on the microbeam exit window. The four here means that this is channel four out of the four channels. And I have a movie which is really hard to see in this lighting, but you can see the two fluorescent spermatica here, and this is actually a movie. Uh, yes, you can see it's a movie because now we started moving the uh, worm uh, vertically. But while the stage is fixed, the worm does not move. And what we're actually looking for now are interesting strains of worms that have radiation relevant endpoints. And uh, we're starting a collaboration with uh, Li Zhan Wu's group in China, who presented a lot of these interesting worms at the conference last week. 
So now that we've been able to analyze, to irradiate our cells or our worms, what do we do with them later? And as an example, I'm going to show a single cell PCR technology, which uh, is what uh, Brian Panay is really interested in uh, putting online. The way he does it now is irradiate cells on a regular microbeam dish and then go in with a micromanipulator, pull specific cells out, dispense them into a multi-well plate, one cell per well, and then run them on a Tachman array. But this is a lot of handling of single cells. You have to be very careful with uh, how you do it. It's time consuming. We want to do it using microfluidics. So our collaborators at Mechanical Engineering have developed this uh, system for cell sorting. So you have these cross channels here. Cells come from the top and then they go arbitrarily into the right channel or the left channel. What you can do is add fluid flow in one of the channels and then the cells will always go in the opposite direction. And you can do this computer controlled, image the cells in this region and then decide into which of the outlets you want them to go. So if you have a double, uh, two populations of cells with different fluorescent stains, you can very easily sort them uh, into two different vials. Now to dispense cells into multi-well plates, one of the things you have to be very careful about, especially for PCR, is not to get a lot of uh, medium in. So the technology or the system we're using has a, a channel here where the cells can flow and then when you detect a cell above this nozzle, you can apply a short burst of pressure. And this will generate a small droplet that can be dispensed, in this case, on a slide. And you can see these are really very small drops. So you don't have a lot of medium confounding your uh, gene expression assay. And again, we, we're doing this on a slide here so you can see it, but we're developing a system for multi-well plates. But there's actually an even easier way to do a PCR. Uh, this is from a, a paper that was published last year in PNAS. What you don't see in this image, or well, what you do see in this image, is a channel where cells are flowed, they're trapped in this region, washed, lysed, and then loaded into a set of chambers where you can perform a QRT-PCR. Uh, this chip has various heating elements on it, it has valves, and what you don't see here is that it has a couple of hundred of these units on the chip so you can look at either maybe 200 gene products or 200 cells looking at the same gene product. And what we envision is on a chip like this you can make a thinned bottom which can be penetrated by a microbeam. You trap the cells here, irradiate them, and then you can either keep them for a certain amount of time and do a time series depending on which cells are released at which time or look at different gene products from, uh, or the same gene product from the s different cells looking at intercellular variation. Uh, this is a nice technology that was pioneered by Attinger's group uh, at Columbia. This is cell encapsulation. And the really impressive thing is that what you have here is a cell in a droplet of medium floating in oil. And this is actually a very small beaker. It has maybe 500 picoliters. So you can imagine that if you irradiate the cell, it uh, puts out whatever factors, but they stay concentrated in that region. And then you can take this uh, bubble and move it, say, to a mass spec system and look exactly what was excreted by the cell. Uh, another thing that you can do is to have two cells within this uh, bubble and then irradiate just one of them. The other cell will uh, see the factors accreted by the cell concentrated very strongly because they're not getting diluted in a large petri dish. So you'll get a much stronger medium uh, transport uh, bystander effect. And you can also take these bubbles and merge them. So if you want to add reagents uh, or you want to lyse a cell in a bubble, you could do that. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit about the of how you interface all of these things. Uh, in a microfluidic chip, 
when you're trying to irradiate and image cells, flows are typically tens of microliters per hour. Now this is a picture of the way we first did these experiments. You have your vial with cells here, you have tubing, the chip, and a syringe pump which is sucking the cells through the system. And what it turns out is that all of this tubing has a good fraction of a milliliter of, vo of dead volume, essentially. It requires priming, and it takes a long time for the cell velocity to stabilize once you apply that strong suction to get the cells from here to here in any reasonable time. So this is not really a very good way to do it. Uh, you really need to be minimizing your tubing. On the other hand, most of the microfluidic systems, at least the ones I've encountered, require some sort of imaging, so they need to be under a microscope. And there's only, you can only get two microscopes so close to each other, because microscopes are big macroscopic things. Uh, you could have multiple systems on one chip that you move around on a stage, but then you're not seeing what's happening in the other regions, and you really do want to do that for high throughput. So we were looking for a way to couple microfluidic chips in a way that doesn't have a lot of dead volume and will allow you to do your irradiation and analysis. And what we came up with is to use capillary tubes. You can have here a 20 microliter capillary tube that has loads and loads of cells in it. You use this one to input cells into your chip and then you're aspiring on the other side of the other uh, capillary. So cells will tra be transferred from here to here, irradiated, and then transferred out. And that can be done relatively fast because you have very little dead volume. And the really neat thing is that you can actually get these capillaries in square cross sections or in rectangular cross sections so that you can do actually very precise imaging on the capillaries. And you don't get the uh, aberrations from uh, cylindrical capillaries. To summarize, uh, microfluidics provides a high throughput automated way of doing single cell handling, a very large number of single cell analysis devices, and in conjunction with the single cell microbeam, it is a very powerful tool for studying radiation effects in both single cells and in uh, small organisms. And I would just like to finish up by showing uh, thanking all the people working on this project, both from the microbeam side and the microfluidic side. Thank you.